Hi folks, Tris here. Thanks for listening to Modem Prometheus, and thanks especially to all of you who have joined our Patreon. We don't run ads, so the whole podcast is supported by you. If you'd like to help out, head over to patreon.com forward slash modemprometheus. Members get free merch, early access, bonus episodes, and a lot more exciting stuff. Today's story is called Tulpa, and is about knowing who you are. There are five candles placed around the little sign. There should be a pentagram drawn between them, a single line bouncing between points to create a five-pointed star. But the grass is damp and the chalk won't stick. It'll be fine, Hannah says. You've just got to, like, visualise the pentagram. The chalk's just a guide, anyway. The important one is in your mind. Jane pulls her coat around her tighter and tries to visualise the pentagram. These autumn nights are getting colder. Hannah claims she doesn't notice, dressed as she is in an outfit consisting entirely of black lace, eyeliner and cleavage. But as she fusses around the candles, Jane can see the goosebumps prickling her skin. The black lace is a recent affectation. Hannah says she's just being her true self. Jane suspects Hannah's true self has something to do with the admittedly very pretty new boy in the upper sixth, who has long dyed black hair and a book by Crowley poking conspicuously out of his bag. It doesn't matter. They are Hannah's friends. Where Hannah leads, they follow. Are you sure about this? Nat asks Jane. Quietly, so Hannah doesn't hear. Do you think this is going to work? Jane shrugs. I don't know. I've never believed in ghosts. Everyone's got a camera phone now. We'd know if they were here. Maybe they don't show up on cameras. Maybe. Hannah has pulled a large book out of her bag with a pentagram on the cover and is flicking through it to find the right ritual. Do you know who this was? Jane shakes her head. It's a simple sign. Alone, on the common. No picture. No real information. A name. Alex. But whoever Alex was, they clearly meant something to someone. There were fresh flowers laid underneath it when they arrived, and a ragged teddy bear was propped up against it. She shivers again, this time less from the cold. It feels like someone just brushed their fingertips through her hair. Hannah says it was some girl who was in Upper Sixth a few years ago. She was out walking on the common one day, then suddenly just stopped and started screaming and screaming and screaming. And then she just dropped down dead. Nat looks around conspiratorially. Hannah says her last words were, Don't let it get me. Don't let what get her? No one knows. Huh. Hannah holds up her phone. The alarm is beeping. Midnight. It's time, she says, and holds the screen under her chin to cast shadows over her face. The witching hour. Cool, Nat says. Let's witch. They take up positions around the little memorial. Hannah places 18 carnations at its base, alongside another with a snapped off head. We call you, she intones. We make this offering, one for each year of your life. One for a life brutally cut short. We call you. We call you. And her eyes roll into her head. Vocamaste. 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 A gust of wind blows out all the candles. Jane's visualising of the pentagram is interrupted when Nat yells, Look! The smoke from the candles is hanging in the air. It moves against the wind, drifting and curling into what looks very much like a face. 
The girls scream and run. The ghost watches them leave. It says, Fuck. The ghost does not know how it died. The ghost does not know who it was. The ghost doesn't really know anything at all. It has a name. Alex. It knows this from the little sign which was left on the common. Once there were some pots with flowers and a small stuffed bear. The pots were quickly taken and the bear is mouldering, though... Every so often, another bunch of flowers is laid. The sign remains, simply reading, Alex, we miss you. It assumes it died here, and it would follow, therefore, that it lived around here. Maybe it went to one of the local schools. Maybe it worked in one of the high-rises. Maybe it had a family. Maybe it had friends. Maybe they visit. The ghost remembers snatches when people come, when they think of whom the ghost used to be. But they are scattered memories, confusing, like pieces of a dozen different jigsaws. The ghost cannot put them together into a picture. When the girls came, with their candles and curses, the ghost remembered walking through school corridors indistinct faces swapping static-infused gossip. It remembered a body it called its own, a body others wanted, a body in which it had supreme confidence in its potential, but was secretly extremely nervous about its application. It remembered walking along the common, alone at night. It cannot remember the reasons... But it has also remembered sailing, the catch of excitement as wind filled the canvas. It has remembered writing a novel when it should have been writing job applications. The only one who didn't give it memories was the middle-aged woman in the business suit, who stopped at the memorial and sniffed like an addict, and the ghost was sure she could not see it. But despite this, she stared straight at it. The ghost pushed itself closer, reaching out what it thought of as its hand. Hello? It said, hello? Can you see me? But the woman walked on, blanking the ghost like it was a beggar. The man comes with his friend in the early afternoon. He carries a small bunch of supermarket flowers, which he lays gently by the sign. The ghost has flashes of spreadsheets, word processor documents, the percussion of buttons and keys. Who is it? The friend asks. They were... The man starts, then stops. I didn't really know them, but someone I worked with did. In their old company. Just had a heart attack over their desk one day. I know it's weird, leaving flowers for that, but it's just anyone can go, you know? Anytime. Nah, man, I get it. His friend looks at the little memorial. Tough thing. What was the company? The ghost asks. Is it around here? Are there more people who work there? Why don't they come here? It is yelling these things, pacing around the pair who stand looking at the sad little monument. The man stops his reverie and looks around, confused. Can you hear something? The ghost haunts the common. It doesn't want to. It would like to haunt... An old, rambling house. One that has been owned by the same reclusive spinster for 70 years, who has never converted it to flats, and drifts around the rooms in tattered gowns, drinking tea and looking after a growing collection of cats. 
The ghost thinks it would enjoy that. Or it could haunt a bar. One of the ones in the gentrified red light district that serve cocktails with a side order of drama. It could whisper in people's ears when drinks are left unattended and scatter the lines of drugs in the bathroom. Or it could haunt a theatre. Or a cinema. The ghost isn't fussy. It doesn't care if it's high culture. It would quite happily watch Wasp Man 4 on repeat if it had the chance. But it does not have the chance. The ghost can travel 135.914 metres from the little memorial. Nothing on the ground provides an obstacle. It drifts through trees, bushes and people as if they were nothing more than wind. As it does, it can feel the little electrical impulses of life, the sparks pushing out from the roots. The people it touches stop and pull out their phones and dash off a message to a friend they haven't seen in years. The trees reach out to their fellows to make sure they are still upright. But the further it gets from the memorial, the thicker the air becomes the pressure increasing like the ghost was a sinking submarine. Go far enough, and the air starts to hum like it was sat under a pylon, the noise getting louder and louder until it's like a wave crashing against a cliff, the pressure gripping the ghost in its compressing fist. Eventually, the ghost can barely move forward anymore. If it tries... It feels like it'll be crushed. It is the memorial which gives it this space. Every time someone visits, something like a wave rolls out of it, pushing the pressure, the boundary, the tiny heliopause of the ghost's world a little further out. If no one visits, the pressure creeps inward. The ghost knows the formulae of its progress. Somehow it knows the memorial's power is higher the closer you are to it, knows the further away you get, the more visits are required to push back the edge of the world. This knowledge it has always had, baked into it from the start. It has never considered why it knows this, but does not know its own name, which is, in hindsight, suspicious. The old woman never knew the ghost. She knows she never knew the ghost. But she thinks people should be remembered. So every few weeks, she comes along and lays a fresh bunch of flowers. The ghost gets memories from her. But it knows because she knows. They can tell it nothing about who it was. But it still knows about the house, which is too big, too empty about how she's closed the old master bedroom because she has trouble sleeping in the bed she used to share and now has moved into the old guest room. It knows how her husband used to smile. It knows she has planted a bed of lavender because he liked the flowers and the smell and when he was alive, she hadn't wanted to pull up any of her vegetables but now he's gone, she can't understand why that would ever have seemed more important. It knows how one day, he didn't come home. It knows how she got the phone call from the hospital. It knows the taste of tears. And it knows how one day, two days after the funeral, a message came through from his number. I love you. No more. No less. She'd consider it a wicked joke, except his phone had been sat in a sideboard drawer for weeks. Untouched. The ghost knows far more about what haunts this woman than it has ever been able to work out about itself. The ghost has made a discovery. It had never before considered trying so it did. And it worked. Not that the ghost has legs, 
but it had always thought of itself as walking. This required a readjustment. It started by pulling itself upward, as if it were climbing a rope, clutching a line that wasn't there with knees it didn't have. Then, tentatively, it placed a non-existent foot on the air and found it supported perfectly. The hum gets louder as it goes higher, just as it does when the ghost approaches the boundary. The dome. As the ghost climbs, it sees the city spread out around it. It looks for the school it went to, the office it worked in. Maybe it can see them, but it can't identify them. It can spot the old woman's street, a garden full of lavender. The hum is strong here, stronger than it is on the ground. It pulls at the ghost like it has sat on the very edge of a whirlpool. And the ghost can see other ghosts. They float above the city, drifting like clouds, following the same paths. They are riding the night bus, the final journey between living and dead. The ghost has never been able to board the night bus. It does not stop anywhere inside the ghost's cage. The other ghosts all head toward the transmitter mast, which stands burning on the ridge. The whole tower glows like a halo. Something within it clangs like the beating of a giant metal heart, and the sound rolls over the drifting ghosts. Then the sound pulls back again, a wave flowing back to the ocean, and the ghosts are pulled along with it, a little closer. Our ghost feels the tug, but is not moved like the others. The sound slips off it, like oil off glass. And it's like the mast has noticed. The ghost feels itself scrutinised, considered, and then harshly rejected. It doesn't know what just happened. The mast didn't do anything, but it feels the dismissal like a stab wound. It staggers and tumbles, the air it had walked on giving way like a cliff. It falls at the feet of the middle-aged woman in the business suit, who looks down at it disapprovingly. What the hell are you doing? she asks. The ghost recovers enough from the shock to say, You can see me. The woman rolls her eyes. No, I'm just stood here talking to myself. She passes her hands through the ghost like a doctor performing an exam, says, Hmm and then goes to look at the little memorial. Please don't touch that, the ghost says. Of course not, the woman snaps. But this does need fixing. You're caught between things, that's not good for anyone. She walks away, tapping into her phone. Wait, the ghost says, who was I? Do you know who I am? Yes, the woman says shortly. You're no one. The man with the tongs comes the next day. He wears blue overalls, a high-vis vest and an expression that has tasted too many cigarettes. He carries a large plastic bag which holds empty drinks cans and discarded takeout packets. He stands in front of the memorial and the ghost has flashes of itself. A big man. A big appetite. Sitting around a pub table with the tongs man, two others a dozen empty pint glasses, and a pair of open packs of scampi fries. It can hear its own laugh and feel the crumbs caught in its grey, bushy moustache. Is that me? the ghost asks. The man with the tongs clacks them experimentally, then shrugs and begins to put the memorial in his bag. What? the ghost says. No! Stop it! Leave it alone! The man pauses, listens to the air. Please, the ghost cries, please don't take it away. It's mine. The man screws up his mouth like he's tasted gone-off milk, then shakes his head 
and returns to the memorial. In go the flowers. In goes the teddy bear. In goes the sign. And he walks away, and the ghost is left alone in its little shrinking dome. The ghost sits where the memorial used to be. It would have its arms clasped around its knees, if it had either arms or knees. As it is, it tries to fold its perception of self into the smallest possible space, so the collapsing dome crushes it marginally later. One of the girls from the seance came by, and looked around nervously confused, before hurrying away. There was no thrum of power, no wave pushing the ghost's cage outward. The ghost felt no memories of who it used to be. Was it the girl who had strutted through the school corridors? Was it the office worker who had a heart attack over a spreadsheet? Was it the beer drinker in the old man's pub? It couldn't be all of them. It didn't make sense. Also, it was fairly certain it was going to die, which, for a ghost, felt extremely unfair. But the crushing dome was approaching, slow and unstoppable, sure as a guillotine. This is it. The woman in the business suit is back, and she's brought with her another woman, shorter, darker, and wearing a driver's uniform. Huh, the driver says. Will you take a look at that? The ghost backs away warily. Who are you? I'm lighter, the driver says. I drive the night bus. And this is Percy, who's sort of my boss. Sort of, Percy mutters, rolling her eyes. And who I'm willing to bet, Lighter continues, hasn't bothered to introduce herself. You collect the dead, the ghost says flatly. That's me. Pick them up, move them on. Have a little chat on the way, you know, driver things. So why didn't you collect me? Why did you leave me in this box? What did I do? Honestly? Lighter shrugs. Honestly, I didn't know you were here. Because you're not dead. The ghost says, what do you mean I'm not dead? So what am I? An art project, Percy mutters. Ignore her, Lighter says. It's the time of year. She's got bad memories. She's always grouchy in the autumn. Percy glares at her, but conspicuously doesn't deny it. Look, best as we can tell, someone came up here a while ago and made that thing. They left the flowers, the teddy bear, they made a sign to Alex. But there never was an Alex. It wasn't a memorial to anyone. It just was. And then other people see it, and maybe they think they know who Alex was, or it reminded them of someone, and something grew from that. So if I'm nothing to do with that, why am I stuck here? Not quite what I meant. Thing is, you're not a ghost. You're a god. What do you mean? What I said. You're a god. You've got a temple. Believers. Here's one now. The ghost turns. The girl from the seance is coming back clutching a bunch of supermarket flowers. She lays them, roughly where the memorial used to be. Then, the old woman comes along the common path. She holds a bunch of dried lavender tied with a purple ribbon. She puts them next to the girl's flowers and smiles at her awkwardly. Then the man from the office arrives, holding a small teddy bear. I heard everything got taken away he said. Didn't seem right. Did you know them, dear? The old woman asks the girl. No. No, but I've got friends who say their friends did. But that's like most of the world, isn't it? 
six degrees of Kevin Bacon and all that. Um, weird question, but do you believe in ghosts? The old woman sighs. I hope so. The remade memorial. No, not a memorial. A shrine is humming with energy. Not that any of the three seem to notice. The ghost can feel it pushing the dome back outwards. Why would they do that? It asks. If they never met me. People know when they walk on holy ground, Percy says. Eh, says Lighter. I don't know. Knowing and caring are two different things. But look, I said you're not a ghost, and you're not. But you could be, if you want. I know you're here now. Go looking for the bus stop. You'll find it. And what will happen here? If I leave? Most likely, people will forget eventually, Percy says. The place won't seem quite as special, won't make them feel the same way. Being a god is give and take. The old woman and the girl have left now. Only the man remains, his head bowed in what looks like prayer. The ghost feels his memories, except they're not memories. They're self-told stories of someone who worked all hours to build a life only to die before they could enjoy it. And it feels the man remind himself, do not do this. Do not let that be me. The ghost says, I'll think about it. Modem Prometheus is written by Neil Merton, the voice of the city is Kate Angier, with music and production by me, Tris Oten. For free merch, bonus episodes, and behind-the-scenes content, support us at patreon.com forward slash modem prometheus. If you're not ready for that kind of commitment, please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this right now. Our next story is due on the dark commute moon, the 27th of November, when we all need light to guide our way. No one will ever truly understand you, and that includes yourself.